The ever-increasing popularity of Smith's watches. It goes without saying that I am a fan. A little under a year ago, I made a simple video about my favorite everyday watch, being the Everest PRS25. The subject became very popular, and ever since then they have become harder to find, more in demand, and always sell out. Sorry. I've been afforded the opportunity to review a handful of new releases along with some classics, like the Navigator, the tribute to the iconic IWC Mark 11, the Air Ministry, focusing on the 6B references given to RAF pilots, the venerable W10. All of those links will be in the corner of the screen if you're interested. But why have these watches become so popular? Simple. They address many areas that we as watch enthusiasts want. Looking back at classic aesthetics and making them attainable without a five-figure price tag, the watch's build quality, dependability, all play into this. So, about five months ago, I approached the owner with an idea that we co-branded. First, some background and a bit of history. As we all do browsing online, sometimes we think of the idyllic watch, and in the area of vintage Oyster models from the Rolex brand, dating back some 60 years, the outliers really do situate themselves as some of the rarest. We've all heard of the 1016 model called the Space Dweller, trial models made for the Japanese market to commemorate astronauts who were a part of Project Mercury. Essentially, Rolex 1016 explorers with different text on the dials made in very limited production that never took off. There wasn't any demand for them. But they are some of the hardest to find, and in this category, the rarest. Along with the Space Dweller, Another, even more peculiar model was introduced at the close of the 1960s, early 70s. Not much is known about them, but they were estimated to be produced around two years, and they were called Rolex Commandos, and their reference number was 6429. These were the bog stock standard, literally zero bells and whistles, a manual wound movement, no chronometer certification, a 34mm case, one of the cheapest in the Rolex catalog, selling for something in the ballpark of half the price of Submariners at the time. It's amazing that they were even sold on bracelets, judging by the price of just over $100 back then. They were only made for the American market, and the collective belief is that these were exclusively made and sent to American military PX post-exchange stores at first. Now you'd think that with a name like Commando printed on your watch, it would be a hot seller for those in the military especially during the time of Vietnam, when reliable watches were sought after by many young men. Turns out it wasn't. The commandos were not big sellers. So a few years later, the excess that weren't sold were shipped out and advertised by Abercrombie & Fitch, a big outdoor outfitter. The watch became exclusive to their catalog, fell in line with their brand identity, eventually were sold, and that's about it. That's all that's known. You'd think that, in our day and age, that there would be reams of information about this watch, but it turns out that it is one of the most underrated unknowns. It's very much a forgotten watch, but the ones that do appear now sell at auction for five digits. Nobody really knows how many were produced and how many there still are in the world, but it's a peculiar design and story that has always fascinated me. The untrained eye will think of this as a vintage explorer in this category. It has most of the hallmarks, typical quarter Arabics, batons, but its aesthetics are very different. Stick hands instead of the Mercedes set, a dial with a much wider arrangement of markers, a white coronet at the 12. In a way, it adopts more of an Air King approach using the 34mm case. Again, remember that these had no exemplary features, and it feels as if Rolex even skimped out when it came to applying loom on the dial. There's hardly any of it. The stick hands, some believe, were maybe an afterthought instead of anything substantial, and the end result is a watch that not only looks entirely different, but also is one with a bizarre backstory. So what if we combined some of the best elements of the 1016 with elements of the 6429? Would there be a smooth way of infusing vintage Explorer DNA with an outlier that has quirks of its own? The concept materialized and the result really does feel quite outstanding. I'll say this much, the tweaks are minor, but collectively there are lots of factors that makes the Smith's Commando feel whole, and a bit more easy on the eyes. First thing was to remove the Mercedes handset and replace them with broad stick hands. It's a well-known complaint amongst many, 
even Rolex owners and enthusiasts, that they don't get along with Mercedes hands. This adjustment simplifies the arrangement and the overhanging counterbalances also add a nice touch of detail that we don't get from many other handsets either. The basic running seconds hand without loom simplifies it more, and the bold serif font of Commando at the 6 of the dial, those two components are the dead giveaway. If you haven't noticed already, the subtlest change is an adjustment to the dial. All the quarter arabics have been shifted to the far edge of it, and this is what changes the look a lot. There is a bit more breathing space on the dial. It feels a lot more old school. And this is one of the biggest quirks of the 6429, the openness, while still maintaining a functional minute track. Another small nod when looking at the case back. This came from the owner when it was time to serialize the model, PRS 47. The 47 is a small nod to 47 Commando, part of 3 Commando Brigade, is a Royal Marines raiding force. You can see that we had some fun on the creativity front. Commando watch with a serial that matches a military unit. But the idea was not to sacrifice some of the greatest traits that belong to the Everest line. The watch still had to be relatable, which is why the triangle deserves to stay at the 12. It's a feature that does tie the rest of the dial together. So comparing the first generation Everest next to the Commando, now that most details have been covered, you can see the differences. Note that the latest generation of Everests looks slightly different to the one that you're seeing, with improved handsets, the more complex Smith's Deluxe Vintage logo. I don't have one at hand. But after experiencing both, to explain how the Commando feels, the wider spaced numerals on the dial gives it a bit more of an instrumental look, I feel. The watch wears slightly bigger on the wrist too, visually. Instead of looking at the 1016 as a reference, it feels like you're looking at a dial that borrows more from the references 5500, the precursors. There's this hint of a dial that looks to have come from the 1950s. The stick hands are what really gives it an edge though. They're squared off, folded down the middle, and the handset gives you this feeling that you're wearing a model from the late 60s, 70s. Having a prototype look to it, and in a way, the equivalent of having sword hands when it comes to legibility. It's not difficult to find the time on the dial in any light. Legibility is excellent on such a small face. And maybe this model could be best described as a field watch by the way it presents itself in this area. Sort of fitting when using the Commando name. Apart from these small adjustments, the Everest and Commando are identical. Case sizes are 36 millimeters. Maybe there will be work on a 39 millimeter variant in the future. 20 millimeter lug width. Over the course of the video, you should have seen these models on different straps and bracelets. The bracelet that this model comes with easily competes with the Tudor Black Bay 58. I actually had an easier time sizing this one. And the precision is there in all the right places when it comes to tolerances. Another funny, ultra nerd detail is that the links on the bracelet match up with vintage C&I bracelets made for the American market. You can usually tell this with riveted bracelets by looking at the mid-links. If they are equally sized, American. Thicker in the middle, European. But the beauty of this model is that it can go with anything. Any color, any form of clothing, any strap. As someone who had a part to play when coming up with the idea of this developmental prototype and call back to bizarre vintage references, this watch does make me smile. And if this model is successful, then many more will come in the future. I just find it amazing to see how a few small tweaks can completely rework a watch, adding some X factor that'll start a conversation. This is what we all enjoy about watches, and it is something that micro brands have the capability of doing when the big names are reluctant to take on these challenges. Sound check, check one, sound check, check two. Favorite everyday watch being the Everest PRS 25. The subject became very popular, and ever since then, they have become harder. Is it the PRS 25? I need to check. Hold on. <laughs> Me and my reference numbers. Let's have a look. Come on. Mm. 25. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Good. <laughs>